Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present in this conference. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators, um, uh, Yaroslav Sukovniak from UCLA. Uh, I've been working with him. Uh, I was working with him uh, until last year. So this is the work that I started there. Also with uh, Amir Yacobi and Bert Halperin. And I'd like to talk about uh, spin superfluidity uh, and the new equals zero quantum Hall state of graphene. And uh, Yaroslav introduced in the, on the very first day uh, this concept of spin superfluidity. And then he went on to talk about you know, sort of detrimental effects which may destroy the state and how that can be sort of overcome in different ways. But uh, in this talk, I'm going to take a step back and go back to spin superfluidity sort of in its original classic form. But I'll talk about how it can be realized in different systems. So a motivation is to see if the phenomena can be realized and also whether um, this uh, phenomena can be used to probe uh, ground state properties of rather complex many body systems. So we want to use it as another a probe to um, look at these systems. Okay. So um, the outline of my talk is to introduce new equals zero quantum Hall state of graphene. And I think that uh, there are probably many, uh, well, few, um, few uh, experts on this field. But uh, uh, I'll just uh, pick and choose some of the details that are important for the rest of the talk. And then I will uh, talk about spin superfluid transport, how that can be realized uh, using quantum Hall edge states as ways to inject and detect uh, spin currents. And then I'll summarize and conclude at the end. OK, so as you know, uh, graphene and magnetic field uh, uh, exhibits uh, Landau levels, which are quite distinct from uh, usual semiconductor quantum Hall systems. And that can really be traced back to the linear dispersion and sort of chiral nature of the electrons. And the particular state that uh, we're going to be interested in today is this uh, zero uh, Landau level, uh, right at the charge neutrality point. And uh, because of this valley and spin degeneracy uh, in graphene, all of these Landau levels are essentially fourfold degenerate. So this shows up. So first of all, the zero Landau level shows up as this uh, step in the quantum hole plateaus. And then the plateaus go up in multiples of four due to this fourfold uh, degeneracy. So we're going to be interested in this particular uh, state at the direct point. So. Uh, the chair of this uh, talk uh, and many others have looked at uh, this Hamiltonian, the Coulomb Hamiltonian for electrons inside the zeroth Landau level. And what they have found is that to the leading order, this Hamiltonian has an SU4 symmetry. And so the finding the ground state of different integer filling fractions within the zeroth Landau level essentially reduces the problem of SU4 quantum Hall ferromagnetism. And so the possible ground state lies in sort of this degenerate manifold of states that's polarized in this SU4 space uh, that encompasses a variety of different spin and valley orders. Um, and this SU4 symmetry can be broken, for example, at the single particle level by Zeeman effect, or can also be broken, down, uh, broken by various short range interactions. And the key question is how is this symmetry uh, really broken in uh, the, these systems? So um, if the Zeeman effect dominates, then the ground state is typically spin polarized. While uh, if short range interactions are taken into account, you can get a variety of different types of ground states. So it was shown early on uh, that uh, if the new equals zero state is in this uh, uh, ferromagnetic ground state, spin polarized ground state, it gives rise to these uh, helical uh, edge states which are U1 symmetry protected. And that should give rise to very distinct charge and spin transport signatures. But uh, subsequent experiments uh, did not really seem to show uh, this kind of uh, conductance due to these uh, conducting edge channels. In particular, when the uh, magnetic field was increased so that the new equals zero uh, state was stabilized, uh, they saw very strongly insulating uh, state. And there was also an experiment done by uh, Young et al. 2012, which showed that uh, the ferromagnetic ground state seems to be uh, inconsistent with the experimental uh, findings. 
So um, there are other possible ground states for this, and one of them is this canted antiferromagnetic uh, ground state. Uh, there are sort of other uh, ca uh, candidates uh, as well. But I want to particularly focus on this canted antiferromagnetic scenario um, because that seems to be most consistent with some experiments that came out quite recently uh, uh, backed by uh, some theoretical work. So this is quite a neat experiment. Uh, in this experiment, what they did was they applied first a, uh, a strong ma a magnetic field purely perpendicular to the graphene plane, in which case the graphene is in this purported, let's say, canted antiferromagnetic state in which the spins on the two sublattices are uh, pointing in opposite directions with a slight canting out of plane due to the magnetic field. Then they started tilting this magnetic field into the in-plane direction while keeping the normal component of the field constant so that uh, because of the 2D confinement, uh, the orbital property of the electron remains invariant. It doesn't change, but you can uh, continuously tune the Zeeman effect on the electrons. So once the, the magnetic field is strongly in-plane, you can recover the Zeeman dominated regime. So there should be sort of a, a crossover or actually a phase transition essentially where U1 symmetry uh, is present here and that symmetry is uh, broken by the formation of the nail order. And the breaking of the U1 symmetry gaps out the edge states and you should get uh, this sort of insulating state which, was, which seems to be observed experimentally. So that's what they seem to see in experiments. So when they are in this Zeeman dominated regime, they see a, a close to 2e squared over h conductance. And then when they go into the uh, canted antiferromagnetic state, purported canted antiferromagnetic state, the conductance drops to zero. So it seems like this near equals zero state may be in this canted antiferromagnetic uh, insulating state. So we want to <coughs> sort of find other experimental signatures to really test this. And I think one way neat way to do this is to look at uh, spin transport through this system and, um, and in particular see if spin superfluidity can be realized in that ground state. Just a comment about uh, uh, the other uh, states within the zeroth Landau level. So uh, in the new equals minus one state, uh, here uh, the chemical potential sits uh, in between uh, the lowest and the second lowest Landau levels uh, within the zeroth Landau level. Uh, and then um, in this case, uh, Zeeman effects favors uh, one of the spin polarizations. So you have a single edge channel that's spin polarized. Uh, and the new equals minus two state, uh, you get two copropagating uh, edge states with opposite uh, spin polarizations. And there was also a recent experiment, now a couple of years ago, uh, which showed that uh, when you have copropagating edge states with different spin polarizations, the edges don't seem to equilibrate, come to a chemical equilibrium, while edge states with uh, different valley polarizations do equilibrate. So they see this in this experiment, and this will be uh, useful for us later on because this gives a way to uh, independently bias these uh, edge states. Okay, so let's try to probe this. Uh, well, I'm not going to probe it. I'm just going to propose a way to probe this using uh, spin superfluidity. And so let me just, I think Yaroslav already, well, Yaroslav already gave the introduction on this. So I'll just be quite brief. But just to see how this uh, phenomenon arises in antiferromagnets, uh, what you do is you start off with uh, classical dynamics for bipartite Heisenberg antiferromagnet in a magnetic field in terms of uh, the nail vector, which is normalized here, and uh, normalized total spin density, which is much less than one in the limit of strong uh, local nail order. And uh, the antiferromagnet has two uh, Goldstone modes, typically, but in the presence of magnetic field, you only get one gapless mode left over. And that gapless mode uh, is associated with the rotation of the nail vector within the U1 plane defined to be normal to the magnetic field. And uh, the azimuth angle within that U1 plane, the conjugate variable to that is essentially the spin, total spin density uh, in the z direction. <coughs> so I define Cz to be a deviation of that z component away from the equilibrium canting value. 
So then if you uh, project this uh, dynamics down to this gapless sector, and so you look at only the low energy sector of this dynamics, then uh, essentially it reduces to these two equations, which are quite uh, suggestive. Uh, first equation looks like the Josephson equation. The second one is just the continuity equation from which you can read off uh, the current, spin current, which is proportional to uh, this gradient of this U1 phase. Okay, so we have a superfluid of spin component that's anti-parallel uh, to the magnetic field here. So it's the Z component, the field is in the Z direction. It's the Z component of spin, which will act like a superfluid. Okay, so um, this is the type of setup that may be able to, may, may be used to uh, detect uh, this uh, phenomenon. And so here we have uh, a graphene uh, sheet here. It's like a hall bar, but it's a graphene sheet. And um, we applied various top gates so that you have these uh, different filling fractions. And so in the middle, you have a canted antiferromagnetic region. And then you flank this region with a alternating pattern of different filling fractions, minus two, minus one, minus two. And so here in the minus two region, uh, these two edge states are emanating out of this uh, ohmic contact. So it's biased at some value. Uh, but this minus two region, uh, minus one region is inserted in between to deflect uh, one of the uh, edge states. So you have one of the spin polarizations going through, while this minus two region is inserted here so that the uh, spin down polarized channel can come in emanating out of that ohmic contact, which may be biased at a different value. So essentially what this effectively allows us is to inject spin current polarized along the Z direction through this edge channel at the bottom and it enters this injection region. Okay. And something similar is happening on this side, uh, but this side is used to detect uh, the spin current that's coming out uh, into the right side. Okay. And one sort of uh, comment I like to make is that in these regions outside uh, the injection region, this part that's colored in green, uh, the spins are polarized collinear to the z-axis while um, inside the injection region due to the uh, in-plane uh, magnetic order of this uh, canted antiferromagnetic region uh, this spin quantization axis may slightly be uh, tilted as it goes through uh, in this uh, injection region. Okay. So this is the type of setup that we like to consider and what I'm going to do is just build a very uh, simple sort of theoretical model to understand how spin transport uh, may occur and how it may be uh, detected in this system. Do you want to elaborate on why, why you want the U equal minus two regions closest to the CA? Oh, right here. Yeah. So we want this closest here so that we have two uh, spin polarized uh, edges coming in here, which allows us to bring in a, a, spin, uh, a spin current, which can be done. I guess what you're saying is it could be done with a single it component. Yeah. yeah, but uh, you want to understand, well, the thing is, uh, if you want to transfer angular momentum from the edge state into the canted antiferromagnet, you need some scattering process in which the spin on the edge has to be lost. If, it's, if there's a single, just nu equals minus one edge, uh, the spin, uh, it's basically uh, just spin halves coming in. There's nowhere for it to kind of sp undergo a spin flip process to scatter into the other edge. This state is essentially uh, uh, polarized in just one direction, one projection. But you need another edge state with a different projection so that the spins can sort of flip and then transfer angular momentum into the neighboring canted antiferromagnet. Yeah. So you, you I need it. I, anyway, we can talk about that. Yeah. Okay, so to build a very simple sort of linear response theory for spin injection and detection, uh, I, I sort of drew a cartoon version of uh, this uh, injection process here. So uh, the scattering between the two edges can occur uh, anywhere along uh, this, this, uh, this injection region here. And um, 
within the linear response, the amount of spin current that's going to be uh, injected from uh, this injection region is going to be proportional to the uh, voltage bias of these two uh, channels. And the efficiency by which the spin is injected is proportional to gamma. So if gamma is equal to zero, uh, the two edges do not equilibrate. They don't, they don't scatter between the two channels and spin current is not injected. While uh, if gamma is equal to one, uh, essentially all the uh, spin current that was coming in uh, was fully injected into the antiferromagnet. So th those are the two sort of limits. Okay. And when the angular momentum is injected, that uh, triggers sort of in-plane uh, nail dynamics uh, through the Josephson equation. And eventually in steady state, the nail uh, vectors will be dynamically processing at some frequency omega which in turn uh, leads to uh, spin pumping back out into the edges. And uh, the pumping of uh, 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 spin back out into the edges uh, when the nail vector is rotating within this uh, U1 plane is proportional to uh, this uh, precession frequency omega and uh, this injection efficiency, this gamma uh, parameter which enters. It's the same parameter which is actually governed here by uh, Anzager reciprocity. Okay. So uh, the spin is being injected through this edge channel through sc scattering of the, between these edge states, which I'll go into more detail now. But spin is injected, and the pumping will uh, eject the spin back out into these two edges, uh, back into the two edges. And the amount of spin current that's uh, pumped on the right-hand side can be detected uh, on this side. So a little bit more uh, details on how uh, the scattering may occur uh, along the edge uh, injection region is that you have a uh, spin current uh, <coughs> coming in here uh, bias the different uh, voltages. And the scattering can occur at the two vertices and also uh, along the uh, line junction in the middle, in between the two uh, vertices. Uh, and here, uh, for the scattering to occur, uh, you need uh, some momentum non-conserving, uh, uh, let's say, impurities, or if you have a sharp change in the direction of the current, that can lead to uh, the scattering between these two uh, edges. Uh, and also, there's a slight misalignment of spins between the outside region and the inside region, which also may give rise to this sort of scattering at the vertex. And so, uh, you can write down a scattering probability matrix at the vertex in terms of this transmission constant T, where if T is one half, there's full vertex mixing, while when T is equal to one, uh, the currents go through without really scattering at the vertex. Now inside the uh, line junction, um, you know, the microscopic details are going to be very complicated, but we sort of uh, lump all of this into a uh, single tunneling conductance per unit length uh, inside this line junction, which we call G. And this uh, gives, quantifies how much uh, the currents are scattered in between these two uh, edges. And this G is going to depend on the, the proximity of the two edge channels uh, and the presence of disorder and also spin flip mechanism that may be uh, provided by the uh, neighboring canted antiferromagnet. But uh, we're not going to really uh, quantify this from a really microscopic model here, but sort of lump all of those details into this uh, phenomenological parameter G. But it's particularly useful because it gives us a picture of how the injection occurs. So this G defines uh, equilibration length scale. So that's the length scale over which uh, the two edge channels equilibrate inside the line junction. And so if the two channels do not fully equilibrate, when it exits the vertex, uh, the rest of that uh, in spin, uh, uh, imbalance may equilibrate over this length scale L. So the spin injection can occur over that uh, length scale. And so uh, including <coughs> this uh, length scale, in terms of that length scale and also uh, this scattering uh, probability T, uh, that can be all sort of summarized into this uh, total sort of edge transport equation where you have this voltage bias uh, and uh, the amount of current that's exiting back out into the right hand side is a product of these scattering probability uh, matrices. 
And so from this, you can read off that the gamma, the efficiency parameter gamma, is given uh, here in terms of t and this equilibration length scale. <coughs> so using the currents, uh, the injected current, the pump current, as sort of the boundary conditions and solving the bulk uh, uh, dynamics, antiferromagnetic dynamics, you can find the amount of spin current that's pumped back out into the right-hand side, and this is given by this uh, ratio of the gamma parameters. Prime now represents gamma on the detection side, and gamma is just uh, the efficiency parameter on the injection side, so we allow them to be different. And so within this linear response calculation, the spin conductance is given by uh, this ratio of gammas. And if you include Gilbert damping, uh, that uh, essentially modifies uh, the, uh, the uh, spin conductance, where it gives this algebraic decay uh, of, uh, of the spin conductance as the length of the sample increases, and also as the width of the sample also increases. OK, so to summarize this result in a, in a plot, um, the transmitted spin current is uh, given here. And um, we just want to look at the spin, effective spin conductance uh, through uh, this candidate <coughs> ferromagnetic region. So let's consider the case when there is a full vertex mixing. And that's the limit where spin current is essentially injected uh, right at this vertex here. All the mixing happens at the vertex. So spin current enters uh, through that vertex. And so uh, there's not so much uh, advantage in increasing the width of the sample because essentially this is a one-dimensional injection. It's basically injected only at this single point. Uh, and as the width of the sample increases, uh, because it's fully equilibrated along this edge, uh, there's no sort of phase space for scattering to occur there. The spin is just injected at this point. So here the, uh, the conductance is just uh, constant as a function of the width of the sample. However, if there's no full vertex mixing, so T is one or let's say uh, three quarters, in that case, there's no full mixing at the vertex, then there is some mixing here, but there's also opportunity for spin to be injected along the line junction. And in that case, uh, if the width of the sample is much uh, smaller than the uh, equilibration length scale, then there is initially some gain in uh, increasing uh, the size of the sample, the width of the sample. Uh, however, when the, once the width of that sample uh, exceeds uh, the equilibration length scale L, uh, then uh, at that point, uh, uh, there's, not, uh, there's no gain in sort of increasing the width of the sample uh, since uh, the edge has been uh, equilibrated over that length scale. Okay, so that, that's why this uh, sort of plateau uh, behavior occurs here. Now, if you include uh, Gilbert damping uh, to this, uh, then um, again, for, for s small uh, widths, the behavior is quite similar. But here, when the vertex, uh, when there's injection only at the vertex, that's the red line here, then increasing the width just increases the effect of Gilbert damping of the system. So spin conductance just monotonically decreases algebraically, while uh, if there's no full vertex mixing, uh, then there's initial gain in increasing the width of the sample, but eventually uh, the Gilbert damping, which scales like the width of the sample, uh, actually um, uh, decreased, uh, starts to uh, decrease the uh, spin conductance. So eventually there's sort of this peak and then algebraic decay as a function of the width of the sample. OK, so to summarize, um, we, uh, we proposed here a way to uh, realize spin superfluidity in this canted antiferromagnetic state and um, you know, showed how one can use, try to use this phenomenon as a way to probe uh, this uh, particular state. So if spin superfluidity occurs in the system, it would be a, a, a smoking gun signature of this uh, ground state. And so we developed sort of a a rather simple linear response uh, theory to understand uh, transport through uh, the system. And of course, the future directions is to have a more microscopic understanding of how the injection 
and detection occurs uh, along the, uh, uh, the line junctions and the vertices. Okay, thank you very much.